Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for dialing in for our webinar today. This session is brought to you by Seavers Instruments and co-hosted by LabRoots. My name is Riley Lay and I will be moderating today's session on a closer look at endotoxin testing platforms. How traditional techniques compared to recent industry developments and how ease of use, productivity, and data integrity can be improved. You can expect today's webinar to last for approximately one hour, 45 minutes of speaking, and then be followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. To submit questions during this presentation, please email them to riley.lay at suez.com. By the end of our time today, we hope you feel more comfortable and confident about making a buying decision for endotoxin testing platforms. We will now begin with our speaker introduction. I am pleased to introduce Meg Provenzano of Seavers Instruments. Meg is a global product manager specializing in biodetection. She has over 10 years of experience in the bacterial endotoxin testing industry. She has held several positions from quality control to technical support to product management. She's customer centric and enjoys problem solving hands on whether it comes down to technical issues, assay assistance or software. Meg majored in marine science and biology at Coastal Carolina University, where she focused on bottlenose dolphin population research. She also assisted in marine mammal stranding rescues and necropsies. I will now pass this along to Meg so we can begin. Thank you. All right, thank you, Riley. Um, as Riley said, we're gonna take a closer look at endotoxin testing platforms today. Here's a little overview of the agenda. We'll look at what exactly is endotoxin and review some of the testing methods. Look at some of the pain points of endotoxin testing today. Give you an overview of our Eclipse bacterial endotoxin test instrument. Look at a method suitability from a case study and then look at how we can simplify the bacterial endotoxin testing and show you a sample validation overview. So what exactly are endotoxins? Endotoxin comes from the outer cell membrane of gram negative bacteria and it's pyrogenic, meaning that it can cause illness when it comes into contact with blood or cerebral spinal fluid. The Endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide comprises 75% of the outer membrane. You can see it right here. It plays a critical role in the structural integrity, the physiological, pathogenic, and immunogenic, immunologic, and nutrient transport functions of the gram negative bacteria. It's essential for the gram negative bacterial survival. So what they did, Sievers developed the bacterial endotoxin testing platform as the Eclipse. Well, we developed it to address some of the pain points of traditional endotoxin testing. So traditional endotoxin test solutions are pretty inefficient and difficult to run consistently. 96 well plate assays require highly trained analysts and labs often have to utilize specialists. There's also inconsistencies from analyst to analyst, a uh, lot to lot variability of uh, the lysate due to its biological nature and also uh, variability from assay to assay. In addition, traditional methods are time consuming Operation. It takes about 45 to 60 minutes to get an assay started while you're uh, making your standard curve and sample dilutions. So time to results um, could be two to four hours, including data analysis and sign off. We see with traditional methods invalid rates of greater than 5% typically. Um, this can definitely vary based on the lab setup, but this is what we typically see with 96 plates or gel clot. With traditional methods, there's a heavy reliance on the LAL reagent, which can be expensive. Um, and there's also a desire for sustainability in the lab. 
typically QC analysts um, often have lots of samples to test. So there's a desire for improved throughput and operational efficiency gains. There can be some difficulty in training new analysts too. It can take a month or two to become proficient at running the bacterial endotoxin test. Ergonomic concerns are another um, reason why we developed this. With traditional methods, there's hundreds of pipetting steps per assay, which can be greatly reduced using the Eclipse platform. There could be some regulatory ambiguity in some circumstances. And then with robotics, it can be difficult uh, to validate them and maintain the instrument itself. So let me give you an overview of the Sievers Eclipse platform. The Eclipse automates the endotoxin assay without the complexity of robotics. The assay prep time is less than 10 minutes because there's an embedded standard curve already on there using RSE. So no need to create a, your own standard curve. It uses a kinetic chromogenic method with commercially available lysate from any vendor. And you can substantially reduce the lysate usage. Um, for 20 samples, you would use one mil milliliter of lysate compared to 10 mils on traditional methods for 21 samples. There's less than 30 pipetting steps to load the positive product controls. It's fully compliant with the pharmacopoeia chapters and also meets the FDA's data integrity requirements in 21 CFR Part 11. As you can see, the platform components consist of an incubating spectrophotometer, which can incubate at 37 degrees C. Um, it can detect the change in optical density, similar to other microplate readers, and then it transmits the data to a software. The software is a customizable enterprise solution. So there's fully customizable user permissions. It's compliant with data integrity in 21 CFR Part 11 and also offers a server installation option, which means that you could have a, a, a lab computer with the software on it and then also a um, manager or office computer with the client installed directing them to the same server. So it allows for easy sign offs and audit trail review with electronic signatures. There's also convenient assay uh, templates. The microplate is a microfluidic liquid handling um, plate. It's preloaded with RSE endotoxin standards and positive product controls. It also can use the FDA licensed kinetic chromogenic LAL. One thing that's nice about the paper plate is that it allows for precise measurement, distribution, and mixing of samples, standards, and LAL. There's a one-to-one -one sample to lysate ratio, which maintains the same biochemistry as traditional microplate readers. Here's a little bit more about the unique microplate. It allows automation through embedded reference standard endotoxin in microfluidics. So the plate itself is divided into 26 segments, five for standards and negative controls, and it offers triplicate standard concentrations at 50, 5, 0.5, and 0 0.005. negative control to be run with every plate. As I mentioned, you can run up to 21 samples. 
So each sample port includes positive product controls and samples in duplicate. The sample LRW and LAL are pipetted into the plate through 27 injection ports. Each segment splits sample or LRW in equal amounts into four reaction wells for a total of 104. Wells. There's 24 months of stability at room temperature storage, so no need to have a refrigerator to store the microplates. And there's an ongoing uh, stability study with a goal of a three year shelf life. So let's discuss a little bit more about how the microfluidic plate actually works. The instrument rotates the plate and uses centrifugal force to move and measure liquids while building pressure. Each dispensing well has two components, a metering chamber and an overflow chamber, which allows for pressurization in the pneumatic chamber. the sample metering chamber versus the overflow chamber over here. And the flow, this uh, allows flow from metering chamber to the overflow chamber. And then here's the LNL metering chamber. So a little bit more about how this works. The instrument slows the plate down, releasing the pressure and precisely dispenses samples and LAL into the reaction wells in a one-to-one -one ratio. So you can see the sampling chambers in green with along with the microfluidic cha uh, channels that allow the sample to mix with the LAL into the optical wells. These are the microfluidic channels for the LAL and then you can see the metering chamber and the LAL overflow chambers here. Again, this allows for precise dispensing of the samples and LAL to mix in the optical well. Here's a little bit closer view, so you can see the optical well and the sample and LAL mixed together, and then also the LAL overflow chamber. So the instrument oscillates the and forth chemicals and standards are mixed with the LAL in the reaction wells. The kinetic chromogenic assay begins and will take um, as long as traditional methods, uh, depending on the standard curve that you choose to run. So let's take a look at the eclipse versus others comparing the eclipse to gel clot in 96 well plates. So with gel clot, um, although it is still kind of considered the gold standard, it is a qualitative method. So yes, it does re um, meet regulatory compliance. Is it consistent and reliable? Not so much. We definitely see a higher retest rate with gel clot, um, especially when compared to the eclipse. Um, C is um, incredibly low. It, like I said, it takes 90% um, more LAL to run 21 samples, um, whereas the Eclipse only uses one milliliter of lysate. The cost is definitely um, reduced. It doesn't take a whole lot, but there is. Um, Something to be said about the cost, the actual cost per test when you compare uh, and look at your retest. So, most expensive test is one that you have to do twice. Data integrity concerns. With gel clot, it's, there's no software involved. So, most regulatory agencies are recommending the use of the 4i principle, meaning that two analysts have to watch as the assay comes off um, after one hour to make sure that there's either truly a negative or truly a positive. Um, and then it's recorded in a lab notebook. So there's definitely no audit trail there. 
like I mentioned, the invalid rate with gel clot is much higher than with the eclipse. And there's no software involved with gel clot, so the user experience is definitely not, not there compared to the eclipse. So let's do a little comparison versus a traditional 96 well plate reader. The, there's definitely the regulatory ones because they both use the same lysate. Um, consistent and reliable, the uh, 96 well plate reader requires a highly trained analyst in order to run it. Um, there's a lot more pipetting steps need a standard curve must be created for each assay um, or for each day, which can increase the variability between um, analyst or even from assay to assay. Not really as efficient as the Eclipse. Um, the 96 well plate reader again uses uh, 10, mil, 10 mils of lysate to run 21 samples. The cost is a little bit different than, uh, between the Eclipse and the plate reader. However, the upfront cost definitely is worth it to reduce your invalid rate. Both of them could be data integrity compliant. There's uh, software out there that runs the 96 well plate reader that meet data integrity settings. Um, again, the invalid rate is higher with a traditional plate reader because of the standard curve creation um, and increased pipetting steps. The user experience and software is incredible on the Siebers Eclipse. It offers an easy workflow where some software for the 96 well plate reader doesn't necessarily. The Siebers Eclipse is also simple. It's easy to run. It doesn't require a highly trained analyst to be able to pipette into the segments. Um, and it also reduces the opportunity for errors and contamination, which can be a concern with 96 well plates as there could be splash, splashing, uh, pipetting errors, and also um, increased handling of CSE or RSE. Um, using an automated standard curve and PPCs reduces the setup 89%. You can also reduce the risk of repetitive stress injury with 89% less pipetting steps. And innovation. We have proven our commitment to listening to the voice of customer um, in order to create this novel microplate and microplate reader to reduce stress on analysts and increase throughput. And it's a sustainable method where it reduces the reliance on the license by 90%. Let's uh, do a little overview of compendial chapter chapters and how to switch endotoxin platforms easily. So some regulatory considerations for an endotoxin uh, test. It must be uh, fully validatable to demonstrate the valid endotoxin tests can be carried out on relevant substances and products. This often includes a procedure for addressing interference or inhibition and enhancement. An additional software test is for chromogenic versus turbidimetric techniques. You can leverage software that fully complies with Alcoa Plus data integrity guidelines and provides 21 CFR Part 11 compliance capabilities, including a reviewable audit trail. Some other considerations are that it must be defendable in an audit by meeting all requirements detailed in the harmonized pharmacopoeias, and also have adequate uptime to maintain a validated state. So, here are some of the uh, compendial requirements based off of the USP and EP and JP chapters. 
must have a minimum three point standard curve um, in duplicate. There has to be at least duplicate negative controls for each assay. Uh, samples should be run in at least duplicate as well. There must be positive product controls in at least duplicate for every sample. And the qualification must use a triplicate standard curve. And another requirement is the use of standardized endotoxin, which could be either RSE or CSE. How does the eclipse meet all of these? Well, as I mentioned, you can run a minimum three point standard curve. The standards offered are 50, 5, 0 0.5, 0.05, and 0 0.005. And not all of those have to be utilized for each assay. You could easily run a three point standard curve if desired. There are there's a um, negative control segment so that a negative control can be run with each assay. Each sample uh, segment is in duplicate along with the sample spike segments. And you can perform an analyst qualification easily through the software um, using a triplicate um, standard curve. Another consideration is to use qualified rooted consumables. So switching to the Eclipse, the Sievers analytical instruments, um, you must first understand the method for each sample type. So we understand that some samples may be tested on kinetic chromogenic or and others on kinetic turbidimetric. So here are some scenarios on switching to the eclipse. So the most uh, the easiest would be switching from a kinetic chromogenic method to the kinetic chromogenic on the eclipse because they both utilize the, a microplate reader. Um, switching from kinetic turbidimetric to a kinetic chromogenic, and then a jet plot switch to chromogenic. Regardless of the current state of testing, it is simple to switch to the Sievers Eclipse bacterial endotoxin testing platform. So going from gel plot to kinetic chromogenic, um, we can see that the gel plot is a uh, technique that's commonly leveraged for difficult sample matrices and for legacy product uh, final release. Many labs still use the gel clot technique for sample types such as water and are eager to implement the method. So customers should perform method suitability testing to confirm that the samples they wish to convert are compatible by performing inhibition and enhancement testing with the kinetic chromogenic lysate. For samples that do not require dilution to overcome interfering factors such as ultra pure water, the process is further simplified because those samples are tested uh, typically undiluted or meat. For product samples, this testing can be followed by a three lot revalidation. Typically the same dilution that works on Gel plot will often work on a kinetic method, but it's always a good idea to perform an inhibition enhancement screen uh, before validating, just to be sure. And that's simple. So you guys can see how easy it is to move from gel plot to a kinetic chromogenic method. Now we'll talk about moving from a kinetic turbidimetric to a kinetic chromogenic method. So one important to understand is why the turbidimetric lysate was chosen in the first place. From our experts' experience and feedback collected, most customers have chosen to work with the turbid turbidimetric formulation because they want a cost-effective quantitative and it was easy to move from gel clot usually to a kinetic turbidimetric uh, method because they're similar lysates. Typically, this decision is not made because there's an incompatibility with the chromogenic method in sample types. 
The simplicity and efficiency gains achieved with the eclipse provide an economical and sustainable option for quantitative results. Customers should perform method suitability testing to compare innovation enhancement turbinometric technique and demonstrate that they can adequately recover endotoxin with a chromogenic method. They would then determine the re dilution required to overcome interference, or DROI. Generally, with switching methods or techniques, it is recommended to perform a three-lot revalidation for final product release testing. And custom customers can leverage the validation feature in the Eclipse software to test the required number of lots, which is a customizable setting at their pace when samples are available. When complete, a clean validation summary report is provided for each sample that meets the established criteria. So there you have it. Switching from kinetic turbinometric to kinetic chromogenic is just as simple. And then the most simple of all is switching from a kinetic chromogenic method on traditional 96 well plates or a cartridge-based system to kinetic chromogenic on Eclipse. This is the most direct transition um, when maintaining the kinet kinetic chromogenic method. The biochemistry or the reaction between samples, standards, and LAL will remain consistent by maintaining the one-to-one -one sample to lysate ratio. The ratio verification is part of the Eclipse system validation process routine maintenance and is a hard-coded protocol within the Eclipse software. Using a validated system, a brief bridge study can be completed to finalize the transition. So to do this, you could perform side-by-side -side testing with the existing sample preparation, which will likely remain consistent. With the simplicity and efficiency of assay set up on the Eclipse, running a bridge study requires little additional effort. So now a little bit and look at a method suitability case study. So a little bit of the background and the test plans. The problem that the customer was facing was inefficient and inconsistent testing procedure. They were testing with kinetic turbidimetric on a 96 well plate. Took one year of method development for these samples. They were seeing elevated endotoxin response. The dilutions were from 1 to 1,000 to 1 to 2,000, and these were required for valid PPC recovery. So a little bit about the test plans on the Eclipse. We looked at method suitability, um, looked at a glucan contamination study, and then the final assay to identify the optimal dilution for each sample, which included um, endotoxin spike challenges. The tests were run to 0 0.005 EU per mil using two chromogenic LAL formulations and two Eclipse microplate lots. So you can see here some of the sample information. So there's three different samples. The endotoxin limit was 700 EU per mil for each sample. The MVD was then 1 to 140,000. And the validated dilution you can see for each sample in this column. The average um, PPC recovery that we saw, and then the average result. So a little bit more about the analytical results. Suitability. Seven dilutions of each sample were run, run on three microplates. Sample three showed signs of glucans. So we successfully rendered an assay with the, using endotoxin-specific buffer. Optimal dilutions for samples one and two were determined. The full spectrum of dilutions run for sample three were run with buffer with and without buffer. 
So we saw for sample one, less than 0 0.005 EU per mil um, endotoxin concentration. For sample two, approximately two EU per mil. And then sample three was between 70 to 100. Here you can see the percent PPC recovery using LRW as the um, to reconstitute the lysate. Here is the 50 to 200 percent range, and you can see sample three is typically very high, which would indicate a glucan contamination. Here's the PPC recovery with ES, and you can see it's much lower for each sample. And then here's a graph showing the recovery for endotoxin challenge spikes. So each sample was challenged with a known amount of endotoxin um, concentration. So sample one, you can see here, sample two, and sample three. And each were able to recover uh, around what they were spiked at. within the 50 to 200 percent, which we typically see for a biological assay. So conclusions, what does this show us and, and what did this help gain for the customer? Well, the customer was able to gain efficiency and process optimization based off of the seven um, assay method development for the three different samples. We determined that kinetic chromogenic was suitable for these sample types, able to automate the test setup, which leads to efficient method suitability, validation, and routine endotoxin testing. So where it took 50 minutes per 96 well plate, and the assay setup was about 20 minutes per eclipse plate, which gave us time to results um, based off of running two instruments simultaneously. Um, so the efficiency for using the Eclipse was much better than using the 96 well plate. The setup time was reduced and we proved efficiency showing uh, with the Eclipse versus 96 well. So here we just kind of outlined the, the study a little bit, the method suitability, Again, using the three samples, seven dilutions for each, three different microplates, and looking at an initial characterization. Then we move to the glucan study based off of the high PPCs. Using the three samples, two to seven dilutions per sample, two microplates, and optimized the method. So then we did move to the endotoxin challenge part using the three samples, one dilution each, two microplates, and confirmed the optimal dilution for each. So let's do an efficiency comparison between 96 well plates and the Eclipse. See here that the setup time was much greater versus the Eclipse down here, because there's no need to create your own standard curve because the RSE standards are already embedded on the plate. So that decreases your setup time significantly, which also significantly decreases your time to results. And then when we compare pipetting steps, you can see that the pipetting steps for all of the assays combined were much, much higher for the 96 well plate compared to the Eclipse. So the Eclipse really only requires 27 um, pipetting steps for a 21 sample um, microplate. So here's how you can automate and optimize with centripetal microfluidics comparison to the 96 well plate platform. Endotoxin testing is challenging and inefficient. There's manual test setup required for hundreds of pipetting steps and it is difficult uh, for consistency. Manual testing 
testing is prone to errors in costly retests. There's hands-on time to start each assay, which can be upwards of 45 to 60 minutes to create your standard curve. And then um, with some other stuff, or audit trail reviews. How is this different than the Siebers Eclipse? The Siebers Eclipse automates the full compendial assay setup using an inter enterprise software. So with the full deal assay setup, we have preloaded standards and PPCs, so no need to create your own standard curve. There's precise microfluidic liquid handling, so the one-to-one -one ratio from of sample to lysate is met. The enterprise software, as we've discussed some, used a client server installation. You can review data from any client workstation including electronic signatures, and there's a dedicated assay audit trail with a streamlined review and e-signature process. So results, which is the most important part. You can start an assay in as little as nine minutes. There's less than 30 pipetting steps, so no strain on the analyst uh, when it comes to ergonomics. There's reduced, reduced time to results because of the um, assay prep time reduction. You can streamline assay data and audit trail review, and you remain fully compliant using a compendial analytical method and using secure data management. Again, one vial of LAL for up to 63 samples because for each assay, you are only using one mil of lysate compared to 10 mils of lysate for a traditional method. Here's another um, chart showing the efficiency comparisons from the 96 well plate in dark blue to Eclipse in light blue. Um, and this is for 21 samples. So you can see the setup time for the 96 well plate takes a, a lot longer than this, the setup time for the eclipse here. Time to results are minimized because of the setup time. And then you can see here again, the comparison of uh, pipe heading steps for 96 well plate running 21 samples versus the pipe heading steps for the eclipse. So how can the eclipse help you? Increase, you can increase your operational efficiency. So assay, as we've said, you know, the assay prep time is significantly decreased. So what does that mean for you? Well, this means that up to a 75% increase in throughput per instrument. You can also gain up to 51 minutes saved per assay. So if you're running four, four assays per day, that's three hours and 20 minutes saved. So three hours and 20 minutes where you could redeploy labor and have them do something else important. So this can increase your efficiency and reduce time to results. Again, increasing operational efficiency looking at the pipetting steps. So with less than 30 pipetting steps for a 21 sample assay, you can see that the 96 well plate is just so many more. So, so what? What does this mean to you? It means up to 89% reduction in pipetting steps, which reduces the risk for the analyst of repetitive stress injuries. You can mitigate staff rotation and simplify training programs. So in order to run an assay on the Eclipse, the training program could be significantly lower in time compared to a 96 well assay that takes probably up to a few months to become um, really good at. And then you can reduce the opportunity for error and contamination because the analyst isn't having to make a standard curve, which can reduce 
um, the opportunity to contaminate your assay by a lot. You can reduce the horseshoe crab lysate usage. So as I've said, the Eclipse uses one mil compared to 10 mils for a 21 sample um, run. So up to 90% reduction in LAL reagent use. Um, secure supply chain for LAL because you could use any of the kinetic chromogenic lysates on the market. Um, this way we can sustain the natural resource of the horseshoe crab for much longer. And again, we maintain the one-to-one -one sample to lysate ratio. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and now I think we have a few Q&A. Riley, I'll hand it back over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Meg. So these are a couple of questions that were submitted previously and throughout the presentation. Let's dive in. The first question is, do you provide validation support? Absolutely. We have a fantastic validation um, protocol that our uh, highly trained analysts or technicians will come in and perform for you to get you up and running in less than two days. The next question is, can the customer choose the LAL source or vendor that's used in the microplate? They definitely can. So all three of the major kinetic chromogenic manufacturers are supported through our software. And there's no need for an unlock code or anything like that to be able to run different manufacturers. Our next question is, if the company has another analytical method different than chromogenic, what validation test do you suggest to perform to make the correlation between methods? Yeah, we can definitely answer that. So um, as I mentioned, uh, switching from kinetic turbidimetric to kinetic chromogenic or from a gel clot to kinetic chromogenic is really easily easy. So you would just confirm that your already uh, validated dilution works um, with the chromogenic reagent. And then we would recommend running a th um, at least a three lot validation. So running that non-interfering dilution on three different lots um, of sample. And the software can help you with that too. There's a validation protocol already in there. We have two questions left. How much sample volume and how much LAL volume is needed for each sample replicate with this platform? The uh, you know what? I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. No worries. And then for our quite final question of this session. How does the Eclipse compare to the gel clot in terms of data integrity? Great question. So with gel clot, there are a lot of data integrity gaps. Um, so as I mentioned, using gel clot, typically the results are recorded in a laboratory notebook. Um, so there's no audit trail for the lab notebook. Um, this is sad to say, but analysts could potentially uh, write down the incorrect results just so they don't have to do a retest. Um, there's a lot of room for error in the gel clot. Um, if you potentially had too much coffee one day and your hands were a little shaky, you could um, look at providing a, a false negative. Um, so there's a lot of data integrity concerns with gel clot. Additionally, uh, regulatory bodies are suggesting using uh, the 4i principle, as I mentioned earlier. So this means two analysts uh, have to watch the results as they come off. So that's two analyst time that you're accounting for for one assay. Whereas if you're using the Eclipse, the fully data integrity 
uh, compliant. So there's an audit trail. There's a unique username and uh, password for each user. Um, there's electronic signatures. So the reports could be signed off electronically. Um, and there's, like I said, the audit trail review is key. That way you can make sure that you are maintaining um, an overview of that assay, which as we are all aware, endotoxin testing is critical for patient safety. So if you can't trust the results or you can't trust maybe your analysts, then we're putting patients at risk um, by potentially having a false negative go out there releasing product, um, which could cause uh, illness or something like that. Awesome, thank you so much today, Meg. Again, if you have any additional questions, please reach out to Meg Provenzano or myself, and we will get back to you. All right, thank you.